In March of 2015, 68-year-old Tamara Samsonova was having renovations done to her home in St. Petersburg, Russia. A friend of hers, 79-year-old Valentina Ulanova, had heard about Tamara's renovations, and she approached her and said, do you want to stay with me while that's getting done? Tamara was very thankful, immediately said yes, and as soon as she moved in, she immediately started picking up the slack by cleaning up the house and doing the dishes and made sure she always cooked food for her friend because she wasn't able to pay rent. After a couple of weeks, the renovations on Tamara's home were complete, but Tamara didn't want to leave. She was really enjoying living with Valentina, and so she asked Valentina would it be okay if she stayed a little bit longer. Valentina was a little bit reluctant, but did ultimately say, okay, that's fine. A couple of months go by, and Tamara is showing no sign that she plans on leaving Valentina's home anytime soon, and Valentina is getting increasingly frustrated with that reality. Finally, in late July 2015, Valentina confronts Tamara and says, you gotta go. And Tamara just says, no, I'm not leaving. This causes a huge fight, but at the end of it, Tamara still doesn't leave. So for a couple of days, the women just do not speak to each other. The silence is finally broken on July 23rd when the women get into a fight about some empty cups in the sink that one of them was supposed to clean, but they didn't, and they fought about whose responsibility it was to do the dishes. And then, of course, the whole subject comes up again of Valentina saying, you shouldn't even be here, you need to leave. And Tamara's like, no, I'm not going to leave. And so another big blowout fight happens. But at the end of this fight, Tamara finally concedes and says, okay, I get it, I need to leave, just give me a couple of days and I'll be out of your hair. Immediately, the tension is gone in the room. They're no longer fighting, and Valentina is happy that she's finally going to get her apartment back, and Tamara says, look, I'll make us dinner tonight. I'll go out and get some food. Tamara leaves the apartment and goes to a pharmacy and gets a whole bunch of sleeping pills, and then she gets the ingredients to a particular salad that she knows Valentina really likes. She goes back, she starts making dinner, and as she's making the salad, she crushes up the sleeping pills and mixes the powder with the salad dressing and gives that to Valentina. And Valentina, who's very hungry, eats the whole salad and doesn't notice anything is wrong. As soon as Tamara was sure Valentina had eaten the entire salad, Tamara just goes up to her room and goes to bed. A couple hours later, at about 2 in the morning, she goes back down to the kitchen and she sees Valentina is passed out on the ground. Tamara goes up to her and sees that she's still breathing, which was a disappointment because she wanted her to die from taking all these sleeping pills. But it doesn't matter. She takes out her hacksaw that she had borrowed from the neighbor earlier in the day and proceeds to butcher Valentina. And she makes special care as she's cutting her into pieces to remove her lungs and not damage them because Tamara had a taste for human lungs. It was actually her favorite food. She took Valentina's head and she put it into a big pot of water and began boiling that to eat it. The rest of her was cut up into as small of pieces as she could get them and then wrapped in a shower curtain and placed in various bags. As Valentina's head and lungs are being cooked on the stovetop, Tamara begins making dozens of trips from the apartment, down the stairs, out the front door, all the way down to the lake that was near their property where she would dispose of the body parts before coming back and getting more. Valentina's hips and legs were apparently too heavy to haul all the way down to the lake, so she took them to a nearby forest. Tamara's final trip sees her carrying a big silver pot, inside of which is Valentina's head, or at least whatever is left of it after Tamara was done eating most of it. Four days later, on July 27th, a young couple that was living in the same apartment complex as Tamara and Valentina were out for a walk with their dog out near that lake. And as they're walking, their dog takes off running and stops in front of this huge bag that it's sniffing and pawing and trying to open. And the owners of the dog try to call it back, but they can't get it to get away from this bag. And so the owners walk over and they kind of poke the bag. They can see it's pretty heavy and they open it up and they find a human torso and it's Valentina's. When the police show up, the first thing they do is they go to Valentina's apartment and they're surprised to find Tamara living there. They're kind of sensitive with her, and they say, your friend, your relative, uh, was just found deceased, and we need to look around the apartment. Tamara was completely indifferent. She did not care. They had just discovered her body, and she didn't care that they were searching the apartment. It was like she knew someday this was going to happen. During the search, the police officers quickly find blood all over the bathroom and in the kitchen. They even find the hacksaw she used that's got blood on it. And they find Tamara's diary that's sitting next to this book about black magic. 
and the police are horrified when they see that the diary contains meticulous notes that Tamara had kept of all of the ritualistic killings she had perpetrated over the past 20 years, and there was 14 of them. And almost all of them were motivated by Tamara's desire to cast spells that she apparently was reading about in these black magic books she had. And virtually all of these spells required human flesh or other human components. And so she would kill these people, she would use their bodies to cast these spells, and then afterwards she would consume them. Not because that had anything to do with the spell, but because she liked the way people tasted, in particular human lungs. The police arrest Tamara, who doesn't put up a fight, and she says, yep, you got the right person, I did all this. While Tamara was on trial, she seemed like she was in a great mood. She told the judge, I hope you give me a really severe punishment. I expect to die in prison. She was seen blowing kisses to reporters. It was like she was just totally out of touch. Or maybe she literally knew this was going to happen and just didn't care anymore. Tamara, who would be nicknamed the Granny Ripper by newspapers over the course of this trial, was given a life sentence, and to this day, she is still sitting in jail. On December 18, 1956, a brand new game show called To Tell the Truth aired on a major American television network. The premise of the show was relatively simple. Four celebrity judges would be presented with three people called contestants who all claimed to be the same person. And this person who they claimed to be was always remarkable in some way. They had some incredible talent or some crazy job or they had accomplished something extraordinary. One of these three contestants was the real person they were claiming to be. The other two people were doing their best to pretend to be that person. And it was the job of the celebrity judges to try to figure out who was telling the truth. So for a set amount of time on the show, the celebrity judges would ask the contestants questions about their background and try to figure out, you know, who was who. And then at the end of the time, the celebrities would cast a vote about who they thought was the real remarkable person. After the votes were tallied up, the host would have the real remarkable person stand up to reveal themselves and the entire audience would go crazy. And that was the show. And the show became quite popular. So popular, in fact, that today, nearly 70 years later, it's still on the air. And over this show's very long history, virtually all the episodes are pretty similar. It's a pretty redundant show. But there is one episode that will forever go down as the most unique. In October of 1972, three contestants walked out onto the stage in front of the four celebrity judges, and they all introduced themselves as Ed Edwards. Then the host of the show read aloud the biography of the real Ed Edwards, and he would say that Ed at one point was on the FBI's list of the top 10 most wanted criminals in America for crimes like armed robbery and impersonating a federal officer, and then after he was finally caught by law enforcement and went to prison, a prison guard helped him turn his life around. And then upon release from prison 14 years later, Ed remained this reformed criminal and became a successful author and motivational speaker who specialized in telling people how to identify con men and criminals and how to protect themselves from these people. After the real Ed Edwards biography was read aloud, the three contestants sat down and the celebrity judges began asking them questions about their past. And then after the time was up, the celebrities cast their votes and then the real Ed Edwards was revealed. And even though two of the four celebrity judges had correctly identified the right Ed Edwards, the crowd was totally astonished at who this guy actually was because he did not look like this ex-convict. He looked like this kind of all-American, middle-aged father who was totally harmless and wouldn't hurt a fly. But either way, the show ended, and then the world forgot about Ed Edwards. Until 2009. That year, Ed's estranged daughter, 40-year-old April Blasio, finally decided to investigate something that had plagued her for her whole childhood. Despite her father's claims that he was this reformed criminal and this stand-up, law-abiding guy, she didn't believe it. She never believed it. She thought he had never been reformed and just was a criminal and always had been. Behind closed doors, Ed was violent and abusive and he was a compulsive liar. 
She remembered in the 1970s and 80s when she was a young kid, Ed would make their family pack up and move sometimes in the middle of the night, and April always assumed it was because her dad was wrapped up in something criminal. But every time she asked him, he would say, oh, well, you know, I was an informant when I was in jail and I snitched on some people and some of those people figured out where we live and so we got to move. April knew he was lying, but there was nothing she could do and so they just kept on moving around. But she always thought something else was going on. So in 2009, when April is now this 40-year-old woman, she's laying in bed one night and finally says, you know what, I'm just going to start Googling some stuff. So she hops on her laptop and she starts typing in the different names of towns that she and her family lived in as a kid. And then after she'd write the name of the town, she'd write unsolved mystery or unsolved crime and she would see if anything popped up. And so as she began looking, she found one in 1980. It was an unsolved murder in a town called Watertown, Wisconsin that happened right around the time that her family very briefly lived in this town. There was this young teenage couple that had left this wedding and they had driven down this dead end road and they were just kind of enjoying each other's company when an unknown assailant who matched the description of Ed Edwards walked up to their car, broke in, shot them both to death and then disappeared. And so on a hunch, April called the Watertown Police Department the following day and told them that I think my father might have been responsible for this double homicide. It's just a hunch, but he matches the description. We were there in this very small window of time when it happened. And so the police said, okay, we'll go have a look. And so the Watertown Police, they tracked down Ed Edwards, who was living in Kentucky at the time, and they got him to give them a DNA sample. And when they tested the DNA sample, it matched these samples that were taken at the crime scene in 1980. And so Ed Edwards, he was arrested and brought back to Wisconsin. And as soon as he was in custody, he confessed to the murder. And then he requested the death penalty. But he was told the maximum punishment for this crime was life in prison. Ed didn't like this. And so he confessed to another double homicide from 1977 in Ohio, where he killed another teenage couple, thinking that would give him the death penalty. But through a loophole, they said, well, actually, that still won't get you the death penalty. You're still facing life in prison. And so frustrated, Ed revealed a third murder he had perpetrated. In 1996, he had killed his own foster son for the insurance money. And so for this crime, he was eligible for capital punishment. And so he was sentenced to death. But he would die of natural causes two years later in 2011 before the state could execute him. Since his death, cold case investigators and members of his own family have theorized that Ed Edwards is almost certainly responsible for more killings beyond just the five he happened to confess to. In fact, many people believe Ed Edwards could actually be the infamous Zodiac Killer, who's one of the nation's most notorious uncaught serial killers that killed 37 people in Northern California in the 1960s and 1970s. If this is true, then Ed Edwards did not become a killer after he was on that game show in 1972. No, when he showed up for that game show and stood in front of the audience and smiled and answered questions to the celebrity panelists, at that time, as you're watching him on TV, he would have already been a seasoned serial killer with dozens and dozens of victims. But Ed stopped confessing to murders after that third confession because he was just kind of using those murders as bargaining chips to get what he wanted, the death penalty. And once he got it, he went silent. And now that he's dead, we're never going to get another confession out of him. And there's no proof connecting him to any unsolved murder cases. And so unfortunately, it's unlikely we'll ever know the full extent of Ed's reign of terror. After spending 21 years in the U.S. Army, a man retires and moves to Central Florida with his wife and young son. Although his family had plenty of money because he had a pension coming in and his wife still worked full time, he just got bored really quickly after moving to Central Florida and decided he would just take a job doing something just to stay occupied. And so he ended up taking a job at a highway gas station. One of the primary reasons he chose this particular job is because the owners of the gas station didn't care if his son came along to help him stock shelves and hang out behind the cash register. And so for years, that's just how it went. The man would work at the gas station and his son would tag along. Even after his son became a teenager and you'd think might be wanting to do other things, well, the town was so small, there was almost nothing to do. 
so his son still came along well into his teenage years. One night in 1990, his son, who was 15 years old at the time, was at the station and he was actually taking a break sitting outside on a picnic table. He was reading a magazine, drinking a Mountain Dew, and you know, it's dark out, and he notices out of the corner of his eye that there is a woman walking off of the highway towards the gas station. It was a very quiet night at the time, so there's no cars getting gas, there's nobody there, and there's not really anybody even driving on the highway, and so that's why she really stood out to him. And he turns and he notices her and he thinks to himself, you know, no one ever walks to our gas station. We're on a highway. Everybody drives here. So she must have broken down and she must be coming here to try to use our phone to call a tow truck or something like that. So the woman is walking across the lot, coming closer and closer to the gas station, and the boy at this point has turned his attention back to his magazine, but he would say later that he kept looking up and keeping an eye on her, because there was something off about her. The woman ultimately walks right behind him and goes in the door into the gas station, doesn't acknowledge the boy, doesn't say hi to him, just walks straight inside, and she starts walking up and down the aisles of the gas station. Now, from where the boy was sitting, it's all glass, so he could clearly look in and see his father behind the counter, and he could see the head of this woman as she walked in and around all these aisles. And as soon as the woman was in the store, kind of pacing around the aisles, the boy put his magazine down and was just watching. And he noticed that she was not really shopping. She was just looking down for a few seconds, wouldn't pick anything up, so she wasn't buying anything. And she would look up at the counter where his father was, and she would just stare at him, and then she'd look back down at what she was doing, and she would go through all the aisles. And at some point, the woman just kind of abandons this phony, I'm pretending to shop routine, and just walks up to the counter. Now, nobody else is in the store. There's nobody else coming in. And so the boy could actually fairly clearly hear what she was saying to his father. And she told his father that she had broken down and she needed a ride. And could he drive her to Ocala, which was the next big town north of this gas station? And the boy would say that his father acted very strangely because his father is normally incredibly pleasant with all the customers. He's very chatty even. Like he talks to everybody who comes in the store. But as soon as this woman had gone in, his dad had seemed kind of dismissive and almost rude to this woman. And when she was talking to him, asking for a ride, he just said, no, I won't give you a ride. The woman is annoyed by how quickly she's been shot down. But instead of just taking no for an answer, she turns and looks at the boy, the boy who's sitting out on the bench, who's looking right at her, and she points at the boy, and she says, what about him? Is he your son? Can he give me a ride? The boy notices that his father, who's not within her eyesight, is looking at his son going, no. Like, whatever she wants from you, you're going to say no to it. And the boy's a little bit confused by this because he's still trying to understand why his dad was so against helping this woman because she clearly needs our help or someone's help. But he just took his dad at face value. And when the woman's pointing at him, he knew, the boy, that if she came over and asked him, he would say no. But it wouldn't come to that because the boy's father would say to the woman, no, my son's not going to give you a ride. You need to leave here immediately. Do not come back. Leave. We're not going to help you. She's furious, she's cussing him out, she storms out and slams the door, she starts cussing at the boy, and she walks off the whole time she's turning around and flipping them off and screaming profanities at them, but she ultimately walks off, and the dad kind of followed her out and is standing next to his son as she walks off. And the boy asks his dad, like, what, what was her deal? Why did that happen? Why did, you, why did you not want to help her? And the dad just said, I don't know, there was just something, there was something off about her, and I, I don't know how to place it, but I did not want her around you. I, I knew I didn't want to give her a ride, I just, I knew she had to go. A year later, the boy is in his room when he hears his dad in the other room yelling for him to come in here and look at the TV. So he runs into the TV room, and on the TV is the same woman from the gas station better known as Eileen Warnos, she was a serial killer who used to pick up her male victims at gas stations in Florida. It's unclear whether the boy or the boy's father were her next victims, but by the time she had shown up at that gas station, she had already killed four people. And following that interaction with them at the gas station, she had gone on to kill three more people, including someone in Ocala, Florida, which was the town she had asked them to give her a ride to. Eileen had been caught, that's why she was on TV, and she was later sentenced to death. In the 1970s, a young woman and young man were on their very first date together, and it wasn't going very well. It wasn't going badly, it was just really, really awkward. They just were not meshing at all. 
And so as they're getting ready to leave and retire for the night, the guy is thinking to himself, I have nothing to lose here. We're probably not gonna go on a second date. And he says to the woman, hey, do you wanna not go home right now and actually come on a hike with me? And he goes, I know this sounds like a terrible idea, but hear me out. I go mountain climbing in this area called Provo Canyon. It's not that far from here. There are these beautiful trails that lead up the side of the canyon to these amazing scenic overlooks. And tonight it's a new moon, so there's great visibility. And I just think that you might enjoy it. And so at first, the woman is obviously a little bit hesitant. But when he says, look, I go hiking there at night all the time. I love it out there. And I promise if there's any weirdness, if you don't like being there, we'll just turn around and leave. It's totally safe. And so after a little bit of coaxing, she finally says, okay, you know what? That sounds fun. Let's go do it. And so their date that had been really awkward suddenly became really exciting. And the two of them were kind of like thrilled, like, wow, look at us making our way up for a nighttime hike through Provo Canyon. And so they arrive at the, the mouth of this canyon and they're both obviously excited and they hop out and they start walking up this trail that brings them into a heavily forested section of the canyon. Now to this point, the guy felt like this was a really great idea. He really had gone hiking here a bunch, and he really did know the area well. But as the trail brought them into the forested area, the guy remembers feeling this overwhelming sense of dread. He didn't know why, it was just like an overwhelming sense of anxiety that something bad was going to happen to them. But he had worked so hard to convince his date to come with him, and had convinced her it was safe that he's not about to let on to her that there was anything wrong with what they were doing. And so he put on, you know, his strong face and just kind of suppressed it and just kept on walking and, you know, holding her hand tight and they just continued their walk. But his sense of dread would just build and build to the point where he was really on edge. And what he didn't know, but would find out later, is that his date, the woman, she also had this horrible sense of dread as soon as they went into the forest, but she didn't want to tell him because she didn't want to seem like a party pooper because he seemed really excited about it. At some point as they're walking down this path, the man steps on something that felt soft. He didn't know what it was, but it caused him to freeze immediately. And he's holding her hand. He kind of jerks her to get her to stop. And before he can even look down and see what he's standing on, he hears rustling coming from the bushes just off the trail. She hears it too. And both of them, without saying a word to each other, because again, you got to remember, they're both really stressed. They haven't let on to the other how stressed they are, but they're both basically ready to leave. And so the two of them turn around and they hightail it out of there. He has no idea what he stepped on. They don't know what they heard in the bushes, but they don't care. The anxiety was so high, they just wanted to leave. Years later, that man and woman who had this very strange date would actually be married. And they'd be sitting down watching TV together and they're flipping through the channels and they land on an interview with a death row inmate. And the interviewer is asking the inmate, was there ever a time that you were almost caught red-handed? And the guy being interviewed says, yes, one time. I was in the forest up in Provo Canyon one night and a young couple came walking up the trail. I didn't see him. So I only had a chance to jump into the bushes right next to the trail. And the guy actually stepped on the body of a girl I had just killed. But for some reason, he didn't look down and see what he was standing on. And the two of them didn't notice me just a few feet away from them. They just turned around and walked away. Turns out that young couple had run into one of the worst serial killers of all time, Ted Bundy. Before Bundy was executed, he confessed to over 30 murders. But many people believe the true number of victims is much, much, much higher. In the early evening of May 7th, 2008, a 65-year-old woman named Zavanna Temelkoska walked around her kitchen inside of her apartment in the little southeastern European city of Kisevo. Kisevo is a quiet place at the base of this huge mountain in northern Macedonia, and while it's totally beautiful, it's utterly remote, and basically nothing really of note happens here. Zavanna cleaned houses for a living, but on this particular day, she was on a day off, and so she was just kind of hanging out at her apartment, waiting for her adult son named Zoran to come home. It was a beautiful, warm evening that night, and so Zavanna had the windows in the kitchen open as she walked around making herself something to eat, and at some point as she was doing this, she heard her phone ring. And so she grabbed it and answered, and she heard the sound of her friend on the other line. But her friend's voice sounded strange. It was strained and very uncomfortable. And she was asking Zivana if she was paying attention to the news right now. Did she have the radio on or the TV? And Zivana was like, no, why? 
and friend would tell her that all over the news right now, there was this huge, terrible traffic accident that had happened in their town, and unfortunately, Zivana's son, Zoran, who she was waiting for to come home, was apparently involved in this accident. Zivana let out a strangled cry when she heard this, and then just dropped what she was using to make food, and turned and ran out the door. And when she did, her neighbor, who was outside, saw her emerge and yelled out to her, you know, hey, is everything okay? And Zavanna, as she literally just continued running towards the road, she basically blurted out to the neighbor that her son was hurt and she was going to the hospital. And this neighbor watched as Zavanna just ran down the road, turned the corner, and disappeared. Zavanna did not have a car of her own, and so literally she was going to run to the hospital to make sure her son was okay. A little while later, that same neighbor who had just watched Zivana disappear around the corner heard a knock on their door. And so the neighbor went to the door, they opened it up, and they were totally shocked at who they saw standing outside. It was Zivana's son, Zoran, who did not appear to be hurt in any way. But before the neighbor could ask any questions about this, Zoran, who looked visibly confused, said to the neighbor, you know, hey, have you seen my mom? We were supposed to meet and have dinner together, and it's just totally unlike her to disappear without telling me where she was going. The neighbor just stared at Zoran for a second, having no idea what was going on here, and then the neighbor was like, well, wait a minute, you know, Zoran, were you in a car accident? And Zoran's like, no, what are you talking about? And then the neighbor kind of filled Zoran in about how they had seen his mother run outside and she had mentioned how her son had been in this car accident and she literally ran to the hospital. Zoran was just as mystified by this as the neighbor was and so Zoran just grabbed his phone and called the hospital to see if his mother was there. But when the hospital picked up, they would tell Zoran that his mother was not there, she had not been there all day, and two, even though they had heard reports about this car accident in town, there had not been any car accident victims brought to the hospital at all that day. And so by the end of that night, when Zoran really had no idea what had happened to his mom, where she was, or you know what was going on with this car accident thing, he just did the only thing he could think to do, which was go to the police and report his mother missing. Nine days later, on May 16th, when still Zavanna was missing and the police had no idea what happened to her, there were no new leads, nothing, on this day, a 56-year-old reporter named Flato Tineski, who actually happened to live not that far away from where Zavanna lived, he got a call from one of his police sources. And the source would tell him that Zavanna had actually just been found, even though this was not public information, and unfortunately, Zavanna was dead. Her body, which had been beaten and strangled and stabbed, had been found wrapped up in plastic and dumped in this illegal dumping area not far from the town's football stadium. The source told Vlado that when her body was searched, they discovered she still had valuables on her person, and so that kind of ruled out the possibility that this was a robbery gone wrong, which was the initial theory about what they were seeing. However, when police had done an initial probe into Zavanna's life to figure out who this victim was, they discovered that she was just this poor old cleaning lady who had no enemies to speak of, and so it really just made no sense that she was the victim of such an obviously brutal and intimate murder that was not financially motivated, at least not on the surface. Flato thanked a source for all the information and then hung up. Vlado's source had sounded really shocked by this murder as he was telling Vlado, but now as Vlado was sitting here thinking about what he had just been told, he wasn't really shocked as much as he was suspicious. He felt like something just was off about this murder. You know, maybe Zivana appeared to be this poor old cleaning lady with no enemies, but in reality, maybe that wasn't who she was. Maybe she was leading a secret life that got her killed. Or maybe she had stumbled upon something she was not supposed to see and that got her killed. You know, Vlado had no idea, but he just felt like, you know what, there's something off about this and it needs to be investigated. Now, Vlado had a reputation in town for being this very aggressive and kind of fearless journalist who had no problem diving headfirst into some of these really murky stories that could involve corruption or misuse of power, and he would get to the bottom of it and he would publish these articles where he spoke really critically about the government, about police, about anybody really who was in a position of power. But as a result of conducting himself this way, over his 30-year career, Vlado had been threatened with violence many, many times for things he had written or things he was about to write. 
But even though Vlado knew this Zavanna murder case had the potential to once again put him in hot water with the powers that be, he still felt like it was his responsibility to dive into this thing and get to the truth. So, feeling determined, Flato grabbed his notebook and pen, and he walked out the front door of his house, and he made the several-minute-long walk over to Zavanna's house. And when he got there, her son, Zoran, opened the door, and a few minutes later, Vlado and Zoran were sitting in the kitchen, talking about what had happened. Zoran told Vlado all about how he came home and discovered his mom wasn't there, and then he went to the neighbor's house, and they explained how, you know, they had seen Zivana running off to the hospital to go look for Zoran, but Zoran's like, I'm not hurt, I didn't get into a car accident, what's going on here? And as Zoran spoke, Vlado took lots of notes and asked lots of follow-up questions, and by the end of this interview, when Vlado felt like he knew everything there was to know about Zivana, he felt like he actually had a pretty good working theory as to what actually happened to Zavanna. And the reason he felt like his theory could be accurate had to do with what Zoran told Vlado his mother did for a living, that she was a cleaning lady. Now, it took Vlado a couple of days to put together his story. He had to go out and interview dozens more people in the neighborhood. But finally, on May 19th, so just three days after Zavanna was found murdered, Vlado published a story in the newspaper. And the story's explosive headline read, A Serial Killer Stalks Kasebo. In the story, Vlado says that Zivana's murder was very likely not an isolated killing. Instead, her murder was likely linked to two other murders of two other women. And these two other victims looked an awful lot like Zivana, literally. They were poor, older women who were also cleaning ladies. And so that was why when Vlado was talking to Zoran and Zoran described how his mother was, what she did for work, what she looked like, that Vlado started to remember these other victims and he put it all together. The other two victims were 64-year-old Mitra Simjanoska, who was murdered in 2005, and the other victim was 56-year-old Lubitsa Lukoska, who was murdered in 2007. Now, Vlado's story was totally explosive, because what he's saying is that there is a serial killer that is on the loose in this town. But this story was also highly explosive, because Vlado spoke very critically about the police who were involved in this investigation. Specifically, he pointed out that the 05 and 07 murders of those two other women, those had been totally mishandled because arrests had been made in at least one of those cases, and clearly whoever they arrested was innocent here. And so the police just totally dropped the ball, at least in Vlado's opinion. And when the police read Vlado's story, they were very upset at him because he was so critical of them. However, the police also did see that Vlado had managed to uncover a lot of new details from all of his interviews with witnesses and people in the neighborhood that did seem to paint a picture of this potentially really being a serial killer, not individual isolated killings. And so the police, based on Vlado's story, would actually begin investigating a serial killer in their midst. They linked all three murders, and they began basically a new investigation. However, at the same time they began this new investigation, Vlado began to notice that he was being tailed all the time by police. He would be out in town doing his job, you know, reporting and interviewing people, and there'd just be a police officer standing somewhere in the distance watching him. But Vlado had anticipated that no matter what, he was likely going to face some sort of blowback from the police, and so he just kind of accepted that they were going to watch him and maybe try to intimidate him, but it wasn't going to bother him, because he had done his job, he had reported the story the best that he could, and if they wanted to watch him from a distance, they could do that. By early June, so about two weeks after Zavanna had been found murdered, the police, in this new serial killer investigation they were doing, had narrowed down their suspect pool, which was in the hundreds, down to just three people. And they felt like they were very close to making an arrest. About a month later, on June 20th, so by this point, Vlado is still being trailed by police all the time, but the police have not come out publicly and said anything about the serial killer case. They're just continuing their investigation. But on this day, June 20th, Vlado's editor at the newspaper got a call from a police officer telling the editor they were about to make an arrest in the serial killer case. And as soon as their conversation ended, the editor called Vlado to tell him the news. But when he called Vlado, Vlado didn't pick up. 
which was very unusual. Vlado always answered his calls. And the editor was also thinking to himself how strange it was that this officer had contacted him and not Vlado. Like, why aren't you going to the guy writing the stories and telling him about this new development? Why are you coming to me? The editor would continue to try calling Vlado several more times, but Vlado never answered. And so ultimately, the editor just kind of assumed that Vlado must be busy, you know, interviewing someone, or maybe more likely, he had already learned about this imminent arrest, and he was on scene, ready to capture in real time this arrest that was about to take place. Meanwhile, on a quiet street in Kasebo, the police had surrounded this very modest two-story home that was very overgrown out front. It was surrounded by tall fir trees, and all the windows had heavy drapes covering them up. And then once the police felt like they had totally surrounded this building, a team of officers walked up onto the porch and knocked on the door and yelled out that they were police, and whoever was inside, come out with their hands up. And for a moment, it was just silent and tense. And then the police on the porch heard footsteps inside the house. You know, they had their guns ready to go. And then the door slowly opened up. And this man, who seemed very unthreatening and kind of confused, stepped out onto the porch. And the police immediately arrested him and took him away. A few minutes later, back at the newspaper headquarters, Vlado's editor got another phone call. And when he answered, it was the same police officer who had called before to warn him about this upcoming arrest. Except this time, the officer was calling to say the arrest had been made, they had caught their serial killer, and then he told the editor the name of the person they arrested. And when the editor heard the name, he dropped the phone in shock. The serial killer was Vlado. It would turn out that Vlado appeared very professional and calm on the outside, but inside he was full of rage, specifically at his mother, who he viewed as this terrible, cruel person. And after she died in 2002, Vlado became obsessed with this idea of getting revenge on his deceased mother. And the way he decided he would do that would be by killing random women who just kind of looked and seemed an awful lot like his mother i.e. they were poor, older, and cleaning ladies. His three victims, Mitra in 2005, Lubitsa in 2007, and Zivana in 2008, had all personally known Vlado's mother. And so Vlado had actually used that connection to gain each of his victims' trust, and then once he had their trust, he would lure them away to strangle, stab, and beat them to death. In Vlado's explosive newspaper story, he lied about a whole bunch of things just to throw the police off. Like, for example, he made up that he spoke to a witness who claimed to have seen Zivana get into a car with two men right before she vanished. Vlado did not see that. That was just a total lie designed to confuse the police. Vlado had also been the one to plant that story on the radio about Zavanna's son, Zoran, being in this terrible accident. You know, that had caused Zavanna to run out of her house and be vulnerable to be scooped up and killed, which is exactly what Vlado wanted. He had called the radio station and told them about this accident, and because he had previously worked for that radio station, they believed him without doing any fact-checking and broadcast the story. And so really that whole radio broadcast was just a very intentional trap by Vlado to kill Zavanna. But what ultimately got Vlado caught was in the article he wrote, he left in some really specific details that the police had not revealed to the public. And so basically by including these in the story, it meant Vlado had an inside scoop into what was really going on. Like, for example, Vlado said that all three of these women who had been killed by the serial killer had been strangled to death by telephone cords that were left at the scene. But again, the police had not revealed that to the public, and so when they read the story, they actually became very suspicious of Vlado and thought he could be involved in these murders. And so when Vlado felt like the police were trailing him just to intimidate him, in reality, the police were trailing Vlado because they thought he could be the murderer. And eventually, when they got a DNA sample from Vlado, it was confirmed that their suspicions were right. He was the killer. After Vlado's arrest, he was immediately charged with two of the three murders, and the police were getting ready to charge him with the third, and they were even looking at a fourth victim, potentially, that maybe Vlado had killed as well, but they weren't entirely sure yet. But on June 23rd, so just three days after Vlado's arrest, he died in jail in a way that really didn't make any sense. 
Vlado had drowned in a small bucket of water inside of his jail cell, while there were three other people inside of that jail cell with him who all said they didn't notice it happening. Officially, Vlado's death was ruled a suicide, and after his death, all of the murder investigations were closed. By most people's standards, Susan Monica's life had been pretty good. She had a small but very close group of friends, she had a great job working as an engineer, and she lived in one of the most exciting cities in the world, San Francisco, California. But Susan was not happy. Moving to the big city was not so much a choice as it was a product of life and circumstance. Deep down, Susan had always been someone who preferred peace and quiet and being alone, things that were in rare supply in a big city like San Francisco. Many nights after work, Susan would come home to her apartment and she would sit there and dream about moving away from the city and living off the grid somewhere, on a farm, you know, raise her own food and be totally self-sufficient, away from everybody else in the world. And then one day in 1991, when Susan was 43 years old, she made that dream a reality. That year, she wound up purchasing a 20-acre farm located in a forest in a little town in Oregon called Weimar. However, this farm was really not a farm. There was nothing on it. There was no house for Susan to live in. There was no barn for her animals or tools. There was no running water, no electricity, no septic system. It was just pure Oregonian wilderness. But to Susan, it was perfect. The property kept her far away from other people, and she liked the idea of having to literally build her own farm. After all, she was an engineer by trade, so she actually knew how to build buildings efficiently and safely, and she was a big, strong, sturdy woman who was not afraid of manual labor. So when Susan finally arrived in Weimar and made her way up the winding dirt road through the forest and arrived in front of her property and looked out at the vast, rugged landscape for the first time, she was filled with a rush of excitement. Even though there was nothing on her 20 acres, it already felt like home. Over the next several months, Susan would transform these 20 acres into a neat little farm, complete with a big barn and a shack for her to live in and a few animal pens for livestock. However, after the farm was built, Susan realized that building the farm was actually not the hard part. The hard part was maintaining the farm, going out there every day and doing all of her chores, feeding all the animals and doing all the different projects she had in mind. It was exhausting. And so not long after the farm was complete, Susan realized that as much as she wanted to be totally alone out there, she had to set that aside and hire some help. And so Susan printed out all of these help wanted flyers and put them all over town in Weimar. And before long, people began making their way up to her property to inquire about the role. Most of these applicants were people who struggled to find work elsewhere, either because they lived a sort of transient lifestyle, bouncing around from place to place so no one was ready to hire them long term, or because they had a criminal record and just straight up could not get a job. But Susan didn't care about either of those things. All she cared about was the people she hired would work hard and they would respect the peaceful, calm atmosphere she was fostering on her farm. Basically, do the work and leave me alone. And over the next 20 years, Susan would find dozens of people who were able to do just that. Most of them would work for Susan only for a short period of time. Others would stick around for a little bit longer, but eventually all of Susan's workers kind of rotated pretty quickly and moved on to other things. And when that happened, Susan would simply put up more help wanted flyers in town and hire more people. And in all the 20 years that Susan had been hiring these temporary workers at her farm, after they did move on and went somewhere else, Susan never heard about them again. However, that was about to change. On January 1st, 2014, Susan, who was 66 years old by this point, was outside of her shack out on her driveway when she happened to look up and see a car coming up her road. Now remember, she lives in the middle of nowhere. No one comes out to see her. So this is a very rare event. And so Susan is totally keyed in on this car. And this car, they pull into her driveway and then out of the car pop three young people. It was two young men and one young woman. And before Susan could even ask them who they were or why they were here, they were telling her. They said they were looking for their father, Robert Haney, who at one point had told them he was working on Susan's farm in exchange for a little cash. And also Susan was letting him park his camper on her property and he was living in that camper. 
The kids said their father always checked in with them at least once every couple of months, but they had just gone this really long stretch without hearing from him, and since he didn't have a cell phone and no permanent address, they had no real way of getting in touch with him, and so they were out there looking for him to make sure he was okay. And so they asked Susan, do you remember our dad, Robert? And if so, do you know where he is? Even though this whole situation was totally surprising for Susan, because she almost never got visitors, so that alone was kind of jarring for her. But when she heard the kids say their dad's name, Robert Haney, she immediately knew who that was. Susan told them that she had hired their father the previous spring to help build a structure on her farm. And initially, Robert was really nice to have around the farm. He worked really hard, he kept to himself, he was quiet, and he had a dog that was really friendly and loving. But in August of the previous year, so five months into Robert's employment on Susan's farm, Susan would tell them that their dad totally changed. He started drinking really heavily and not really working very much and spending a lot of the day just kind of ranting and raving outside of his camper about how he wanted to exact his revenge on someone. Susan would eventually find out that what Robert was talking about is apparently one of his kids had been assaulted and he felt very guilty that he had not been there to protect his child. And so the way Robert was handling this guilt was by drinking and thinking about getting his revenge on the attacker. Now, while Susan did understand why Robert felt the way he did and why he was kind of acting the way he was, it didn't change the fact that Robert's behavior had become very disruptive on her farm, and the one thing Susan really wanted was peace and quiet. And so she decided she would have to go confront Robert about his behavior and potentially fire him if he couldn't find a way to calm down. But before Susan ever had to do that, Robert one day just walked right up to her shack, he handed her an envelope filled with cash, and he asked Susan if she wouldn't mind looking after his dog for a while. And Susan was so taken aback by his complete change in behavior and this request that she just took the envelope and said, okay, I'll look after your dog. And then Robert nodded his thank you, he turned around, and he walked away from her. And then a few moments later, Susan's standing there with the envelope in hand, watching as Robert is climbing into some white car that had just pulled up in front of the property. She didn't know who was in the car with him. And then the car turned around and drove out of sight. Susan told the kids that that had happened back in September, so about four months ago. And since he left, she had not heard from him, despite the fact she still had his dog. And she told the kids that a lot of Robert's stuff was still in his camper. Susan brought the kids over to the side of her property where Robert's camper was, and when they went inside, sure enough, all their father's things were all over the place. But the one item that immediately stood out to them was their father's tool belt. They knew their father was a traveling handyman, that was how he made his living, and so it begged the question, why would he leave his tool belt here if he knew he was going to be gone for several months potentially? It didn't make any sense. After leaving Robert's camper, the kids thanked Susan and asked her to please be in touch if she learned anything else about their dad, and she said she would. And then the kids got back in their car, and they began driving south towards the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. When they got there, they asked to file a missing person report for their dad. However, they learned very quickly that it was going to be very challenging to locate their dad because their dad lived this transient lifestyle with no cell phone, he had no permanent address, he had nothing that could really be traced. But the investigators agreed with Robert's children that their dad's absence was a big concern given the fact that his last interactions with Susan had consisted of him drinking very heavily and talking about going and getting his revenge on his child's attacker. And so the sheriff and the deputies were very concerned that that was exactly what Robert had done. He had gone out and potentially murdered someone and now was in hiding. So they asked Robert's kids if they could think of absolutely anything that could possibly allow investigators to track down Robert. And at some point, one of the kids said, oh, what about my dad's EBT card? EBT cards, or electronic benefit transfer cards, are like debit cards for state welfare services. You can use the cards to buy things like groceries, and the cards are definitely traceable. A few days later, when Robert's EBT card trace came back, investigators saw the card had been used just one month earlier in a Walmart located about 30 minutes southwest of Susan's farm. Now, this trace obviously didn't tell investigators where Robert was right now or what kind of condition Robert was in, but they had no other leads to operate on, so they decided they would go to the Walmart and see what they could find. 
When they got there, the investigators were led to the back room of the building where they were able to review the security footage from the previous month when Robert was supposedly there with his EBT card. But after reviewing hours and hours and hours of footage, the investigators never saw Robert on camera. However, they did see Susan on camera, and unbelievably, she was the one using Robert's EBT card. And so obviously, this was very suspicious, and right away, the investigators left the Walmart, went back to their office, and began the process of getting a search warrant to search Susan's farm. A few days later, on January 10th, the sheriff and his deputies arrived at Susan's property, and when they pulled onto her driveway, Susan came outside to greet them. When she asked them, you know, what's going on, they told her, hey, we're here to search your property in connection with Robert Haney's disappearance. And before Susan could ask any more questions, the sheriff said to her, hold on, just turn around, let's go back inside, I need to talk to you privately. And so Susan, who was very shocked by this, just said, okay, and she turned around and led the sheriff into her house while the other deputies fanned out across the property to begin this big search. Once inside of Susan's house, they sat down in her kitchen, and right away, the sheriff says to Susan, okay, I have you on camera using Robert's EBT card. I know you stole it, so you need to tell me where Robert is right now, or it's going to get a whole lot worse for you. And as soon as he said this, Susan's look of shock on her face quickly turned into a look of kind of relief. It was like suddenly she understood what was going on here. And she says to the sheriff, no, I didn't steal his EBT card. He gave it to me along with an envelope full of cash when he left four months ago. And he told me to use it to buy dog food for his dog that I'm looking after. And since Robert had been gone for all these months, she had run out of cash to pay for the dog food and now was using the EBT card. Susan also added that if she had just stolen the card from Robert, she wouldn't be able to use it because it requires a PIN number, and Robert gave her the PIN number. That's how she was able to use it. The sheriff was not totally sold on Susan's story, and so he continued to ask more questions, trying to trip Susan up about how she came to acquire this card, but Susan was very firm that Robert had given her the card, and that was it. And so after several minutes, the sheriff realized that Susan was likely telling the truth, which meant the EBT card angle was likely a dead end, and they would have to call off the search. But as the sheriff was standing up to leave the kitchen and leave the property altogether, a deputy from outside came running into the kitchen and without saying a word, just bent down and whispered something into the sheriff's ear. And as the sheriff is listening to this deputy, his face is contorting in disgust. He can't believe what he's being told. And after the deputy stands up and leaves the kitchen, the sheriff takes a deep breath and then looks at Susan and says, Ma'am, you're going to have to come with us. Back at the station, a now very flustered Susan was led into a small interrogation room where she sat down looking totally anxious. She's looking around, wondering what's going on. And then the sheriff walked into the room, immediately hit record on the camera, and then looked at Susan and says, Has anyone died on your property? The story that Susan would tell the sheriff that day in the interrogation room was so completely unexpected and horrific, it would make headlines all across the country. Before Susan began this story, she told the sheriff that everything she had said about Robert Haney's disappearance had been the truth. However, she had left one little detail out. After Robert had handed Susan that envelope full of cash and the EBT card, and then climbed into that stranger's car and driven away, after that, Robert had actually come back to her farm, and recently. Susan said she discovered his return when one morning she got up and she went outside to go feed her animals when she looked over at the pig pen and saw all the pigs who would normally be laying down and lounging around at that time of the day. They were all up and they had converged in one portion of the pig pen and they had kind of formed a circle around something on the ground as if they were all trying to look at something on the ground. Now, Susan said this was totally uncharacteristic, so obviously something weird was going on. And so Susan dropped her food and rushed over to the fence. She climbed into the pig pen, and as she got closer and closer to all these pigs, she realized they weren't just looking at something on the ground, they were eating something on the ground. And so Susan goes right up to this ring of pigs, and she begins pulling them aside, and then right in the middle on the ground is Robert. He was laying on his back and his insides had all been torn out. It was like the pigs were disemboweling him. And the most shocking thing is Robert was still alive. He was moving his arm and groaning. 
Susan tried to pull the pigs off of Robert, but she said they kept coming back and really aggressively continued to eat Robert. It was like they were in this feeding frenzy. And so Susan said, you know, I thought about lifting him up and moving him, but Robert was practically split in two, and she felt like if she tried to move him, that would kill him anyways. And so Susan said she did the thing that she thought was right at the time. She left the pig pen, went into the barn, got a shotgun, ran back to the pig pen, raised the weapon, and fired it into Robert. Susan told the sheriff that this was purely an act of mercy. She was ending his suffering. After Robert was dead, Susan said she just left the pig pen, and then three days later, she went back into the pig pen with bags and collected the little bits of Robert that had not been eaten by her pigs. And then she took those bags of remains and chucked them into her barn on top of the trash pile. But clearly, Robert's remains had not remained in the barn because the thing that deputy had whispered into the sheriff's ear when the sheriff was talking to Susan in the kitchen was... Sir, we found a leg outside. It was Robert's leg, and it was found not inside of the barn in the trash pile, but out in the middle of her property, just out in the open. Susan, when confronted with that information, suggested that, you know, maybe a wild animal had gone into the barn, got a hold of it, and dragged it off. The sheriff didn't even know what follow-up questions to ask, and so he just said, well, why didn't you call 911 when you first saw Robert? I mean, maybe we could have saved him. Or at least, after he was dead, why didn't you tell someone? Susan would say that the reason she didn't tell anyone is she was afraid that if word got out about what her pigs had done, then her pigs would be euthanized and she would lose a major revenue stream because she sold her pigs' meat in town. And she said, even if her pigs were not euthanized, she was worried people in town would not want to buy her pigs meat after they learned her pigs were attacking and eating humans. Susan would tell the sheriff exactly where they could find the bags that contained Robert's remains. And she even said she would take a polygraph test to show she was now telling the whole truth. But when she actually sat down to take the polygraph test, she kept fidgeting and coughing and doing these really dramatic sighs, and it was causing the test operator to get really inaccurate readings. And so when this first polygraph test was over, the results were inconclusive. And so the investigators made Susan take another test, but again, she continued to fidget and yawn. And so finally, the investigators in the room watching this happen just called off the test. And when they did, they said to Susan, you know, hey, we're going to search your farm. And if there is anything on your farm that you have not told us about, you're going to be in serious trouble because we're going to find it. At this point, Susan kind of stopped fidgeting and she looked up at the investigators. And after a long pause, she reached out across the table and grabbed a piece of paper and a pen. She pulled it back and she began drawing something. And after a few seconds, it became pretty clear she was drawing a map of her farm. And after the map was all drawn out, she drew a big X in the middle of it and then slid the map back across the table to the investigators. And she said, if you go to that X, you'll find Stephen. And the investigators are like, who's Stephen? We're talking about Robert. What are you talking about? Well, it would turn out Robert was not the only farmhand to die on Susan's property. In 2012, about a year before Susan hired Robert, she hired another man named Stephen Delacino. And according to Susan, Stephen was a lot like Robert. He was really easy to get along with, he was quiet, he worked hard. But at some point, Susan said they had a big falling out. Susan said she started to suspect that Stephen was stealing her guns in her barn, and so she went to confront him. And during this confrontation, they got into this big fight, and Susan said she didn't really remember all the details of what happened next, But at some point during this fight, a gun went off, and then Stephen fell to the ground in the middle of the pig pen with his head bleeding, and all of Susan's pigs suddenly swarmed him and began eating him. The stunned investigators again asked Susan, okay, if that really happened the way you said it did, why didn't you call 911 if this was like an accident? And Susan would say again that her big fear was her pigs would either be euthanized or word would get out that her pigs were eating people and the people in town would not want to buy her pigs meat because of that. In the end, as far-fetched as Susan's stories were about what happened to Robert Haney and Stephen Delacino, there was never any evidence that actually contradicted her claims. And so as a result, when Susan went on trial for murdering Robert and Stephen, it came down to whether or not the jury believed Susan. And they didn't. Not at all. 
They believed that Susan was completely lying and that in reality, Susan, who was known to have a very quick temper, shot Stephen and shot Robert very much on purpose and then threw them into her pig pen. We can only hope they were dead before her pigs began eating them. On April 21st, 2015, more than a year after Robert's children had reported him missing, Susan was convicted of two counts of murder for Robert and for Stephen, and two counts of abusing a corpse. She was sentenced to a minimum of 50 years in prison. While in custody, Susan would be overheard saying there were 17 other bodies buried on her property. However, when the police went out there and searched again very extensively, they never found any other remains. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin Podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to make the Amazon Music Follow button a cup of coffee, but be sure it's full of coffee grounds. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our main YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. We have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that honors and supports victims of violent crime as well as their families. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. Go to mrballin.foundation and click Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. If you want to check out our merch, join our Discord server, or just see what's going on at Ballin Studios, head on over to our brand new website, ballinstudios.com. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya. Rave, rave, rave in cave. Me no think, me just move. Feel the bass. Feel the groove, heart beat fast, feet go wild, me dance free like a cave a child. Move, move, feel the groove. Mm-hmm. Stomp your feet, feel the ground, bases back all around. Get ready now, feel the rise, look up high to the skies. Cave rave, cave rave, no stop now. Everyone scream, everyone shout. Jump in fire, dance with flame. Caveman party, all insane. Are you a fan of the Strange, Dark, and Mysterious? If you are, then you're in luck. Because our very popular Strange, Dark, and Mysterious podcast, called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, is no longer exclusively on Amazon Music. It is now available on all podcast platforms, and it's free. So, if you haven't listened to the Mr. Ballin Podcast since it went exclusive in 2022 with Amazon, well, buckle up, because now there's over 200 episodes on this show, and many of them have never been told on YouTube. They are only available on the podcast, and you got all of them right now to go binge. You can find those special podcast exclusive episodes just by looking for the words podcast exclusive in the individual episode title. So again, the chart topping, highly popular Mr. Ballin podcast is once again available on all podcast platforms and it's free. To listen, just search for the Mr. Ballin podcast on Amazon Music or wherever else you listen to your podcasts and then give the show a follow and start listening. Also, if you're one of the amazing people who continued listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast on Amazon Music when it went exclusive, well, don't give up your subscription just yet because there are still major perks for people listening to the show on Amazon Music. With your Prime membership, you can listen to brand new episodes of the Mr. Ballin Podcast 30 days earlier and ad-free on Amazon Music. But again, the show is available on all podcast platforms and it's free, so go enjoy. 
So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's story, be sure to check out our podcast called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, where we have literally hundreds more stories, a lot like this one, but many of those stories are only available on the podcast. Again, it's called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and you can listen to it on Amazon Music or wherever else you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. Until next time, see ya. Wait, don't go anywhere. If you're looking for more strange, dark, and mysterious videos, click here. As many of you may know, the biggest event ever to come out of Ballin Studios is fast approaching. From September 26th to October 20th, I will be on tour. I'll be visiting 15 cities across the United States, telling strange, dark, and mysterious stories live and in person. Last year, we did one show. It was a sold out show in Austin, Texas to kind of trial run this concept. And it's basically just me on stage telling stories and people loved it. And there was huge demand for more. And so here we are doing 15 more shows. Tickets for these 15 shows have been selling very quickly, but there are still tickets available if you act basically right now. All you have to do is go to tour.ballinstudios.com, find the show that is you know nearest you or whichever one you're interested in, click on the link, and if there are tickets still available, you can buy them through that link. And if you're lucky, there might even be some VIP tickets left, which will give you access to meet this guy, if that's of interest to you. Also, just for our VIP ticket holders, bring your copy of our graphic novel and I'll sign it for you when we meet. And so the way you get the book is either you have already pre-ordered it or you can buy a copy at the theater. We'll be selling them on site. Again, I'm gonna be on tour from September 26th to October 20th, telling stories in person. It's gonna be great. If you wanna go, there are still tickets, but they're going quick. Just go to tour.ballinstudios.com and get your tickets today. Okay, back to the stories. I want to create a mildly effective... <laughs> mildly effective... <laughs> I want to make a mildly effective cold medicine made exclusively out of Egyptian fire ants. <gasps> Take its horn off its head and you beat it to death. <laughs> Say go! <laughs> die. You... You die. <laughs> Turned and leapt head first out the glass window. <laughs> Yes! Got up on its flippers and began chasing us down the cave. A nice hot thigh mug of musk. And we settled on a piping hot plate of... Piping hot plate of eagle tonsils, your smoked chicken gallbladder eggnog, your zebra cornea souffle. Get to go surfing. Surfing. But it did No! Yes, it did. Papa, tu dois avoir. <laughs> Papa, tu dois avoir. Lungy was already in there, and he looks at me, and he says, Papaye, de veriamos terrificado com hello fresh. Oh, Lungy, he put on... <laughs> ooh, Mr. Bolin, ooh. It's not even funny. If you're wondering why I just shared a whole slew of me just butchering my various intros and different parts of strange, dark, and mysterious videos, well, it's because you all asked for it. Last month, in our first ever Mr. Ballin newsletter, we posed a question. We said, what do you want me to share with you the most? And overwhelmingly, what you all wanted to see was a compilation of bloopers. And you don't want to miss the next newsletter because maybe there's something else you want to see, and that newsletter might give you a chance to actually see that thing happening. And also, remember, the newsletter encompasses basically everything we're up to, both things that are coming up in the future, things that you might have missed, what we're doing now, and it's designed to be really easy to consume. It's very visual. It's not all text. Like, it's very beautiful. It's an incredibly good newsletter. And so to sign up, all you got to do is go to ballinstudios.com and input your email, and boom, you're signed up. Also, you can just click the link in the description below. That will also get you signed up for the newsletter. And then we will deliver it to you, you know, once a month and boom, there you go. You're in the know. So thank you to all the people who have already signed up. And in advance, thank you so much to those that are about to go sign up. And I'm sorry to those that plan to not sign up because really you're missing out. And you know what? Seagull Lung, he's going to be pretty disappointed in you. So there's that too. Okay, peer pressure. Go get it done. Ballinstudios.com. Sign up for our incredible monthly newsletter. Thank you so much. See ya. Wait, don't go anywhere. If you're looking for more strange, dark, and mysterious videos, click here.